So, um, so welcome tonight. We're going to talk about Africa. And um, this is the fourth in our series, maybe our, I think our fourth, um, in our Once in a Lifetime series. Um, we've just published our most recent issue a few minutes ago, um, which had an article in it about the Northern Lights from, uh, from the very first one that we just did. And next week we'll be publishing an article on the Canadian Rockies because next week we have both, uh, well, not next week, but soon we have both Canada Day and Independence Day. So we're gonna do a little special feature on Canada and the US. And then we have the Camino, and then we have this. So, um, so what we do in these sessions, um, obviously we're recording them, we wanna share them. And this is a, a little bit different way of uh, talking about things. It's not an expert uh, webinar. Um, and some of you have been on the other ones, so you know what I mean. You are the expert. So those of you that have gone, we wanna hear from you. And those of you that haven't gone, we want to know what questions you have so that everybody can participate. So, um, so that's what we're doing tonight. And, um, and of course, if you are a uh, lead a tour, we would love to hear from you. Um, and if you've gone on a tour, we would love to know any tips and recommendations. Um, so that's, that's kind of the way we're running it. Um, I've got I've got some questions I'm going to ask, but I wanted to start off by doing a quick, um, a quick round of introductions. And if I could ask everybody to, I'll call your name out, but if I could ask you to just say um, your first name and what city you're calling from and whether you've been to Africa on a safari or whether you want to go to Africa on a safari, that would be a great way to start. So Diane, you're on my top left, so I'm gonna start with you. Okay, I'm Diane, I'm in Montreal. And yes, um, we did a safari uh, years ago. Um, how many years ago, Shelley? 10 years ago? Um, about 10 years, doesn't matter. Uh, we basically, the safari we did was in Tanzania. We, we had had a, a vacation in South Africa and then went to Tanzania to do the safari. It was wonderful. It was a really, really wonderful. I, I, I would recommend it to anybody. It was beautiful. I'd love to go back. That's great. Thank you, Diane. Mm -hmm. uh, Trina. Trina? Oh, okay, we'll come back. Uh, Sandra? I'm Sandra Phillips, and I'm also in Montreal. And um, I've done safari in South Africa. Um, and I'm not an animal person at all, but it was on a bus. <laughs> uh, and I really, really enjoyed it. And I'm listening hard because um, I have a grandchild that I will be taking on a safari in a, whenever we can in the next year or two. So I'm listening for some ideas of a safari that she might enjoy. She will be about 15 at the time. Great, thank you. Carolyn. Hi, I'm Carolyn from Halifax. I haven't been on a safari, but I want to go. I'd like to go with my daughter who's 27. We've talked about it um, for a couple of years now. And so, you know, now it's on hold until it's safe to go. But yeah, really, we really want to <laughs> see the wildlife. And yeah, so I'm here to get tips, mm. tricks, info, advice, and all that. Great. Welcome. Uh, Linda. Hi. Um, I'm from, I, I live in um, Dover. Oh, sorry, I lost you there. Is it me or is it you? <laughs> can't I can't hear either. Can't hear. can't hear either. Linda, you want to try again? Love me. Oh, kind of came back. Okay, yeah, some, it sometimes happens. I don't know why I would Zoom, but anyway, I'm trying to get there. It's supposed to go in October. Who knows? And where are you from? That I'm calling from Delaware, Dover, and okay, okay. Debbie, it's Debbie. 
Debbie down your, I think just on your phone. No, okay, uh, we'll come back. Morna. Ah, can you hear me? Yes. I'm calling, uh, I'm zooming in from Ottawa and uh, I have been doing some research on uh, for a couple of years because I promised my daughter for her 45th birthday to take her on safari. Well, she's 47 now <laughs> and uh, we hope to go next year. Great, thank you. Uh, Cheryl. Oh, hi, my name is Cheryl. Oh, did I make my picture go away? Oh, there we go. Um, I figured it out on my, I'm on my iPhone. Um, I'm Cheryl Kaler and I'm from Belleville, Ontario. And I have not been, I'm just here getting some tips. Great. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, Margaret. Hi, I'm actually Margaret Lynn Foley. I go by Lynn and I'm calling in from Winnipeg, Manitoba, mm. Canada. I um, have never been to Africa, but it's definitely on my list. I can't wait to go. I was uh, all signed up to go on a global trip with Friendship Force International um, in uh, 2019, but unfortunately I fell and broke my leg just mm. before the trip. So I missed out entirely and I, I have to, so I have to do it. I, I can't believe I missed that trip. So can't wait to go. I would love to hear everyone's experiences and suggestions. I have lots of questions. Okay, we'll come back to you for those. We'll, we'll start with you on the questions. Uh, Maureen. Hi, can you hear me okay? I'm on a, okay. Um, I have not been on a safari before, but it's something on my um, 70 things before 70. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that I want to do. And uh, I know in a couple of people who have gone on safaris, and they only have phenomenal things to say about it. So it's a, it's a must, must thing for me to do. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, let's see, Joy. Well, yeah, I haven't been on a safari. I've thought about it for a while, but thought, you know, maybe, maybe it'd be too much for me. I, I don't know. I like the comforts and stuff. So I mm -hmm. need to get some tips on, on whether it's appropriate for somebody of my age to go. So I'm here to listen in and, and hear your lovely tips. That's it. If anyone can do it, it's you. I'm sure. <laughs> I don't know about that, Carolyn. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously, Joy, you should do it. Oh, you love it. <laughs> well, you want to come with me? <laughs> yeah. I'll need, to, I'll need someone to hold my hand if I do it. <laughs> I love animals, so it makes it makes sense because I love animals of all sorts. Mm. Yeah, I do. So. Right. Um, Diane. I am here from South Florida, like right in the middle between Miami and Fort Lauderdale. I haven't been. Um, my dad went three different times and I have his journals. And I would really love to kind of reconstruct his trips. Um, I'm definitely into the animals and taking pictures of them, even though I'm not necessarily the best photographer, but, and I really uh, liked hearing that 70 things before 70. <laughs> definitely, yeah. definitely this, this is probably 50 of the 70 things. <laughs> how, about 90, how about 90 things before I'm 90? <laughs> And that's gold. Uh, Mary. Hi, I'm from, um, calling from Charlottesville, Virginia, and I haven't been, but like a few of you, I, uh, my daughter and I have talked about going. Great. And let's see, who did I miss? The Jane. Oh. Jane? Hi, I'm Jane. I live in Pompano Beach, Florida. Just North of Fort Lauderdale. I uh, have not to Africa and would like to go looking at OT for a probability within the next year and a half. Great. Uh, Trina. I'm, I'm here. Okay. Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm Trina. And um, actually, I'm from New York. Uh, I, 
I've traveled from, I've traveled into South Africa, um, but I did not go on safari. I was reading something about Karen Blixen um, early, well, this week I'm reading a book and they're talking about her in the first um, part of the book. And it just sounded very interesting and very coincidental that you were doing this presentation this week. So I said, let me join. Thank you. So which book are you reading? Is it Circling the Sun or is it? No, it, it's actually a book called The Women I Think About at Night by Mia Kankimikaki. You're mm -hmm. familiar with her. And um, she, the first part of the book, she talks about her experience and parallels it with Karen's experience and, you know, the, 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 the historical things that was truly going on with her during that time. Yes. That's great. Thank you for sharing that. Did I miss anyone else? Teresa, I think. Teresa, are you able to, you're still muted, I think. Let me see. Okay, well, if Teresa can come on, that would be great. And Nora, do you want to say hi and introduce yourself? Bye. Remember how to unmute? Totally. Um, hi, everyone. I am Nora. I, uh, I'm the co-founder of Animal Experience International. And so what I do is I help people travel ethically with animals. I'm also on the advisory board for Journey Woman. And, um, and all I do is harp on people about animals. And so when people say they're not animal people, I say, I bet I can make you into one. Um, and so I'm here to answer any questions at all. Um, about ethics, uh, about animal experiences, up close, far away, things like that. And, and I do just wanna say that like, I'm not here to judge. I'm not here to like, listen really closely and be like, you did something wrong. That is not why I'm here. We're all learning together. And, um, and I'm also not here to chastise you if you have a question. There's no bad questions. And uh, I just, Love talking about animals, um, and I've been I've been on safari a few times, and I've been to uh, a few countries in Africa. So I do um, I do, and it is hot as Africa right now on on Vancouver Island where I live. So I am uh, I'm all ready to chat with everyone about uh, safari and animals. Thanks, Nora. Did I miss anybody? No. Okay. So I I'd like to start by hearing from the people who have questions who haven't been. And, um, and Lynn, was it you? You said you had lots of questions that you wanted to ask. Um, but let's, you can either put some in the chat, that's fine, or you, can, um, or you can ask them, but we'd like to just kind of get that out first. So what are the questions that you have about a safari? Or about Africa, actually. Okay. Can you hear me? I'm not muted. Okay. So uh, just uh, about, I have about five or six questions here. So I'd like to know when um, it will be safe to travel to Africa with, you know, considering COVID and everything else. Um, I am uh, wondering about malaria and yellow fever. Um, when I was getting ready to go on my first uh, jaunt that didn't happen to Africa, I was not given the yellow fever vaccine um, because of my age. I'm over 60. Mm -hmm. uh, I just wondered if other people had the same experience. And I wondered um, how serious malaria is and whether people took the malaria pills, which I know have some bad side effects. And what kind of clothing is recommended to, uh, you know, protect you from bugs and how you cope with the heat, which can be really intense. And I'm, I'm assuming that the best safaris are in the Masa Mara, Masa, I'm not saying that right, Masai Mara mm -hmm. area, as opposed to the Southern Africa areas and Kruger National Park, but I, people that have been there, I'd really like to hear your recommendations on that as well. Um, so if that launches a discussion, great. And I'd be happy to hear from everybody on those ideas. So I'll put myself on mute again. Those Thank you. Great. Thank you, Lynn, those are great questions. Does anyone else have questions to add to that? Basically the same one, it, South Africa versus 
the Kenya, uh, <laughs> Tanzania. Okay. And Joy? Um, I just wondered if there's a company that it's recommended um, more than the others, um, Nora, if there's an ethical company, you know, is dealing with animals. I would like to know about that. And the best time of year to go, if I decide to go, I would like to know that. And um, I had another question, but I've forgotten what it is. So <laughs> senior, senior moment. <laughs> I have that's, that's it really. I, I want to know that if I do decide to go, that I pick a company that's going to do the right thing. Right. right. Yeah. I, I, you know what? I, well, Lynn, uh, you um, muted yourself there. I, I would really as uh, uh, second what you've just said. I'd really like to make sure that I'm not causing any harm to, yeah. you know, the environment yeah. or to nature on that kind of a trip. And, and if there are companies that are more ethical, uh, I, would, I would pay for that. That's my, that's my value structure. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Diane. So along the same lines, every company that leads tours has beautiful write-ups and you know every day is an amazing write-up about what you're going to do on safari. And I find that really hard to get behind what they're really saying that, you know, past the, the flowery print. And I've had experiences going like to Galapagos where it ended up being much more hiking and less animals than I had really thought. So I want to make sure that I really get the trip that I want when I do go. Yeah. So I, I want to hear more about how you make that decision and how you evaluate, you know, anyone you ask has a different favorite travel company, but yeah. I want to know more about that process to really make sure that I can pick the right trip. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Uh, anyone else who? Uh, Cheryl. Cheryl. Yeah. Sorry. yeah. Um, D all the above. <laughs> What, had, what else has been said, asked. Um, I like the best time of year, but I also understand there's migration. So if we, you know, you want to be in the right spot at the right time, you know, you don't want to go to the north when they just went to the south. You don't want to be in the south when they went to the north, this type of thing. And I don't know when that is. So when I say best time of the year, it's, um, uh, you know, maybe not so much. Well, I guess we want to know when the dry, when the rainy, but when the animals, the, the, the big animals will be around. Yeah. Great questions. Anyone else who hasn't been? No? I have been to Kenya and I uh, and I regret not spending more time and going into other countries. You know, you go all that way. And I was there for about a week and a half and I cannot believe I didn't stay longer. So um, those of you that have been, um, who would like to start? And, and the question I would like to ask you is, you know, we're talking about um, we're talking about once in a lifetime trip. So, what that means to me is this is more than just a trip. It's something that is meaningful to you, and in, in, in a way that um, you know, when we talked about the Northern Lights, we talked about the connection we have with nature. And uh, Joy, for example, had some beautiful words, which you can read in the article that that I just published um, around how it made her feel. Um, I'd love to know from those that have been, what was, what was the experience you had? Where did you go? What kinds of things did you do? And, and how did it make you feel? I'm willing to go. Sandra? Uh, yeah, I'm willing to start. Um, Thank you. I wanted more than just to see the animals. Um, and I chose South Africa for that reason, because I honestly, knew very, very little about apartheid and what that country was like before, during, and after. So my trip was um, a, a mixture of history and safari. Um, I, I went with a company called Smart Tours um, and it was extremely inexpensive. Most people scared me telling me safari is gonna be six, $10,000, all these crazy numbers. 
And their trip was two weeks, 3,000, including airfare. And we did four safaris in those, in, in those weeks. A lot of the time, um, I learned an awful lot about N Nelson Mandela. We got to visit his different homes. And I went on a separate trip to Robben Island. We got to go into one of the districts. We got down to the point where the penguins are at the tip of South Africa and up to Table Mountain. I really understood a lot more than I knew before about the people who lived um, in South Africa before apartheid, what happened during and after. So I really accomplished my goal of learning more of the history of the country, plus had the wonderful enjoyment of safari. So those of you who are asking about questions, when I travel to places, I look at temperature before I, I go and I choose it by temperature. If I remember correctly, I think I believe we went in February because it also was um, low mosquito time. So there are times you go and you really don't have to deal as much with malaria and mosquitoes. And I didn't, and I think all I had to do, if I remember correctly, was take a malaria pill two days before one of the parks that had possibly a mosquito problem. I think the entire time I was there, maybe saw 10 mosquitoes. So um, I, I was worried about that before I left, but that I didn't really run into the problem at all. Um, and I don't remember what else I was gonna say here. Um, anyway, so I was really happy. The hotels were fine. Um, th those of you who are worried about, maybe you're like too old for safari, whatever. It, there's nothing really challenging about sitting in a van and driving around for four hours finding animals. Oh, oh yeah, I now I remember what I was gonna say uh, about seeing animals. The, the guides on all of the tours, make sure you see the big five, like that's like the goal of a lot of the tourists. Um, and so if somebody's out in an area where they're seeing one of the big five, they have a cell phone now. They just call the other guides and they all wind up uh, near that area. Um, I think I made a list of maybe 40 to 60 different kinds of animals we saw. So I did see a lot. Um, I, I really, there was no lack of animals, even though we were only in South Africa. <laughs> and, and there's this other country, and I forget the name, which is on the eastern part of South Africa. We did one safari in there. Um, starts with an H, long name. <laughs> so you did a lot in two weeks. Not really. We were in Cape Town a few days and we went up and did safari, 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 and then ended in Johannesburg. So mm -hmm. it didn't feel rushed at all. Mm -hmm. Not just that. That's great, thank you. Anyone else who's been? Diane? Um, I would concur with um, Sandra. When I go anywhere, the weather is one of the things that drives me. It won't put me off if it's, if it's not convenient, but I try to, as much as possible, get the temperature, the weather to match my, what it is I want to do. So we went in about the same time in February. It, for, for, but we, we did our safari in, although we went to South Africa and spent three or four weeks there driving around, we ended up doing the safari in Tanzania because I needed to see the Serengeti. I really mm -hmm. had to get to the Serengeti and I wanted to get the Ngorongoro crater and I wanted to do all that stuff. So, so we concentrated on Tanzania for that stuff. So, but the disadvantage is that it's not the peak for the wild beast migration. So I had to basically compromise we, we saw a, a fair amount of wild wildebeest, so it was wonderful. We didn't see the caravans of them going down. I would have ideally loved it, but that's at, at really a different time of the year. So I thought, okay, I've got to basically, there's pros and cons of what, what it is I want to get done. Um, what I really enjoy, because you talked about where it, get, where it gets you, where the feeling you have is, I love the animals. And I, I was going to say, Nora, I was going to say the same thing. I'm not really an animal person. Like, where it said that before, I can't remember. Who. <laughs> but I, I do, I do like animals, but I'm not like the following over animals. However, I really did enjoy it very much. I, you have to admit that it's just watching them in their environment and watching them with their their babies and watching the, how they they care for each other. And at one point, we just we were just basically our little um, 
Jeep. There were just four of us. It was, uh, we went with a couple uh, with two friends and, um, and, and the driver and our guide. And that day it was just the four of us and we happened to be up on our own. And we ran into a herd of elephants with their babies. And, and I swear, I still remember this experience. They were basically, we stopped because they were coming and crossing the road. And they actually stopped and turned to look at us. It was like, I dare you. It was that look, I dare you to <laughs> touch my babies. It was that look, they just turned and just kept going. And we said, oh my God. Those kinds of things, you know, come, they get you, they really they touch you, you know, um, and I was pleasantly surprised. I was concerned, Sarah, by, uh, Sandra, by, you know, how you say, easy, they can call each other and they, they have a sighting of a, a leopard in the tree, you know, kind of thing. And I was, I was concerned that it would be like, you feel like you're ganging up on the animals kind of thing. But I was very uh, pleasantly surprised that they were cautious and they they didn't um, didn't invade the animal space. You know, I felt that we were we were careful about not invading their space. And maybe it depends on what kind of safari you go on too. I, I honestly, I wish I had looked at my notes before we came on, but I remember researching it a lot before we went, before we picked a company to go with. And we didn't go on a tour. We basically did South Africa on our own and then flew to Tanzania and met up with the safari group, you know, and then left there and, and then went off on our own again to, to um, Zanzibar. So, and saw a little bit more of Tanzania, but so I had to research the actual group, the, the safari group a lot more than I would have had I relied on, I think, a tour company. But I was pleasantly surprised at how, um, how good it was. And Joy, you know what? Seriously, it was, there's no way you have to worry about accommodations. You, I think you, I, there are lots of different things that you can do. There's low end, and I don't mean low end bad. I just mean like the accommodations are not as luxurious. So you, there's, there's a gamut of, of accommodations that you can have depending on, on the safari that you choose. So if you're looking for, I don't mean luxury, but if you're looking for comfort, you can do it with comfort easily. Mm -hmm. um, the the only time we were outside, we had, we had to, it was a glam, it was a tent. It was like, but it was glamorous, you know, with our own bathroom and like a whole bit. But I swear, the, I have to tell you about this experience. So, okay, talking about the experiences and and getting close to the animals. I had a thing. This one time, we were basically in a tent, but this glamorous tent. But we had to walk from the main tent to our tents at the evenings to get back to our rooms, right? And they warned us to not come out at night. If we did, to basically, um, mm -hmm. there was, a, uh, I think, a horn of some kind that we had to, and they would come and get us, and they would walk us back to wherever we wanted to be. They didn't want us out because the animals would be roaming around, right? Mm -hmm. And so I got really paranoid. I'm thinking, oh, God, you know? And all of a sudden, so we're in this tent, and I'm hearing a noise against the tent. And Shelly, my husband, saying, Diane, will you relax? I say, oh, my God, there's something out there. There's something out there, right? <laughs> I kept going, oh, my God. I couldn't relax. So I finally fell asleep. And everybody that was in our group knew that I had this thing about the animals getting too close to me, you know? Mm -hmm. So the following day, I hear a bunch of people saying, don't tell Diane. Don't tell Diane. What happened is there's a woman and her daughter you're talking about the, the women that want to go with their daughters or their grandkids mm -hmm. well there's this woman that did this with her daughter this was the one trip they wanted to do together so they were in this tent together what happened is that the woman wanted to sleep in and the daughter wanted to go do the safari that morning the, the mother had had enough of safari she says i'm sleeping in so she stayed in her tent now the tents zip up inside and out so they're zipped right so apparently what happened after the mother left or whoever was that went, one of the one, one of the women went after she left, the other one went back to bed and all of a sudden here's the zip, right? And thinks that it's the other one coming back. Well, no, it was some baboon or something that had unzipped the tent, both sides, ran into the tent, grabbed her water bottle and ran back out again. <laughs> <laughs> so, so like, and she went, and everybody later on said, well, how dress you so? I was just so stunned I couldn't react, you know, like it was quickly. So the, you really do get close and they're really not harmful, but everybody could think, Jesus, don't tell Diane that happened, you know? So, I, I mean, there's all kinds of experiences that we had, but it was a wonderful experience. It was, that's why when Joy says, would you go, would you go? Yeah, I'll go back. 
But I, but we talked about which ones. Somebody said which countries: Botswana, Tanzania, you know, you know South Africa for Kruger. There's a whole bunch of places. I, I kind of wish I'd done Kruger too, though, because Kruger is apparently very different from, mm -hmm. you know, the the Kenyan or Tanzanian. Um, uh, uh, safaris and and but but oh what the other thing I was going to say what touches you is it's not it was wasn't just the animals for me it was the scenery I I was actually disappointed in the Serengeti because I was expecting so much of Serengeti I it was nice but for me it was in Gorongoro crater you look out on it and go oh my god it's just so beautiful and you can see the expanse of the land and you can see the animals in the distance and it's just it's beautiful. It's absolutely beautiful, you know. Um, so it's not just the animals. It's the actual geography. It's the place. It has a. I don't know. It's, it says something to you, you know. It's beautiful. Beautiful country. Yeah. Sorry, I've talked a lot enough. Uh, Sorry. I, I stayed in a, um, a, a intense as well, but in a, an area that had fences around it, and mm -hmm. we would go out every morning running. Uh, with the Maasai warrior and oh. I actually I was kind of like oh we don't really need him like you know it's nice if he could come with us you know with his spear and 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 then as we were running one morning um, I looked over to my right and there was a whole herd of zebras like mm. right beside us running almost running with us and then I realized, oh my God, there are animals everywhere. Like, of course we yeah. need them. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Right? Because the elephants, yeah. what happens in the villages, we were told, is the elephants don't really know the difference between a building or a, anything else. And so they'll, mm -hmm. walk, they'll walk into schools or houses. Mm -hmm. They just walk around and don't pay any attention. So, um, mm -hmm. so that was a bit of a wake-up call for me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I, Actually, you mentioned the you mentioned the Maasai warriors. So the one thing that I that I really enjoyed is the Maasai meeting the Maasai. Um, mm -hmm. When we were there, we spent a day with them. It's just that was another experience that you, you wouldn't get in in South Africa, I don't think, uh, because you'd have to go further north to to get to meet with yeah. the Maasai. But that was another yeah, we really met, great experience. Yeah, we met other indigenous people there. Yeah. Yeah, there's other groups. I want, yeah. yeah, I want to tell a baboon story as well. Our guy yeah. told us a story of when um, he was out camp he was camping with his family when his daughter was a baby. He pulled his car over to the side, and they were emptying the car to set up their tent. And the baboon went into the back of his car and took his baby out of her back net and went running off with her. And he, oh. really, so talk about having to think quickly. He took a bag of cookies, threw it at the baboon. The baboon went for the cookies, dropped the baby, and the baby was saved. So for the rest of her life, whenever she was naughty, he would say, should have let the baboon take you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. Nora, how about some of your experiences? Yeah, yeah, I was going to say... Um, <laughs> I don't, I don't have a follow-up to a baboon trying to steal my baby, but um, <laughs> baboons are a real problem um, because they are smart mm -hmm. and curious and have little human mm -hmm. hands. And one of the things when you're looking for an ethical center or an ethical uh, safari is having them tell these stories and having biologists or uh, park mm -hmm. rangers on site mm -hmm. or uh, paid members of staff because they're able to say, we know where the animals are from, what they're doing, uh, how to keep you safe. And also there's a lot of science that can happen at the same time. You're spending money to be there. They wanna spend money looking at these animals. Um, so, so I've been on safari in Sierra Leone and Kenya and South Africa and Uganda. Um, and, and I would say it's really difficult to uh, and Malawi, sorry. I was like, is there another one? Mm. There is. It's really, really difficult to say that there is a good time to go and a good place to go because they're all so different. It's sort of like when people from Europe go, oh, I want to come to Canada. 
where should, what city should I go to? And you go, uh, well, there is a lot. Mm -hmm. It's very, very similar that um, if you go during the rainy season, of course, that's the migration, that's baby season, that's amazing. But then there are mosquitoes. If you go in the dry season, there are less bugs you're still going to see amazing animals. Mm -hmm. It will just look a little bit different. And it's the same when you, depending on what country you go to, we went on safari in Sierra Leone and it was through the upcountry and we saw amazing, incredible animals and, you know, chimpanzees and, um, and all sorts of weird and wonderful birds. But then in Malawi, Malawi is a super interesting country just north of South Africa. And they used to have so much wildlife there that they gave elephants to Kruger and said, we have so many, you good. Um, and it's the 10th poorest country in the world, but they have a huge uh, forestry reforestation program going on. And they're putting tons of money into funneling it towards safaris rather than poaching. So when you're looking for a program, if uh, or you're looking for uh, a safari group, people that are saying like, looking it right in the face and saying there used to be poaching or there is poaching. This is how we're not doing it anymore. This is how we're funding it is really powerful and really helpful. And, mm -hmm. you know, Diane, you said that when you went to the Galapagos, there was a lot of, a lot of walking. Um, there, there are so many different types of safaris. And I think one of the best things we can do, um, especially for joy is say like, what kind of safari do you want to go on? There are safaris right now in Kenya and in Tanzania that I am champing at the bit to go to because they're mountain bike safaris. And oh. so you take your mountain bike around. <laughs> and... Look at Joy. <laughs> yeah. Look at Joy. It's okay. No, no. We can have a bicycle built for two. You can get in the back. Mm -hmm. <laughs> But then there's anything, you know, from that, you can also have, you know, you can go glamping and you can sit in a car and it will be just as amazing and just as incredible because you're seeing the vast expanse and you are seeing these animals that have always been here and we're just visitors. Again, it's like people, I used to live in Toronto and people would come and see raccoons and be like, that is the cutest animal I've ever seen. Be like, oh, yes. <laughs> I guess they are cute. It's very similar to when we talk about how amazing baboons are. Sorry, you asked me one question and I, I went on for a while. <laughs> uh, someone also, I'm going to talk for a little bit longer, did ask about malaria. Malaria mm. is the, the drugs that you take for malaria, there is a massive spectrum now. It used to be that you could only take one and it was hallucinogenic. It was quite hard to take. Um, we have quite a few different types of malaria medication. And I would, um, well, so when, when my volunteers go away, uh, you can take whatever you want. You're an adult. But we say, you know, really, really look into what malaria does versus the side effects. Uh, because if you do get malaria, you often have malaria for the rest of your life. It stays in your blood system and you are sick for a long time. It also kills a lot of people every single year. So it's, um, it, it is not the best thing to, uh, the medication is hard on your body, but it is, uh, it is a lot harder to, to deal with malaria. The other thing before you go away, you know, long sleeves, bug repellent, and I always travel with a bug net with me. Most places will have bug nets that you can put over your bed, um, but for the just in cases, and sometimes I have been places that bug nets have holes in them, you can get them at REI or MEC or, you know, anywhere for like 10 or $20, and they're quite little. It's just, it makes me feel a lot nicer. Um, not only do I not want to have um, malaria or other things. Um, I also just don't like creepy crawlies. I love animals far away from me. Uh, so it's nicer to just be enveloped by a net and be safe. <laughs> now I was thinking about yellow fever um, vaccine too. And I know when I went, it, it's, it was in short supply uh, and took a few months to get and, and then they, they only open it up at a certain time so that they can share it with, with other people. So I think that's, it's part of the planning, right? Figuring out when's the right time to get vaccines. I think uh, when my daughter and I went to Kenya, we had to get about 10 vaccines. 
yeah. over a period of about two months and then a booster, I think a year later. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and look at like, there are some countries that won't let you in unless you have the, the yellow mm -hmm. fever vaccine. Mm -hmm. um, and there's some okay. places like Malawi is a beautiful country. It is the warm heart of Africa. I think everyone should go there. Lake Malawi is incredible. Um, if you go swimming, you will have to take pills that are bigger than my thumb mm -hmm. because they have some creepy crawlies in there. So, I think doing a like, and it is, it, it's the, the pills that you get are just at the local pharmacy. They're very inexpensive. It's fine. But just before you go, uh, talking with the safari company, just doing a quick Google and saying like, what will I be exposed to? I don't think that there's ever a time that you go, oh, that's like, I really don't want to go on a trip because of, um, because the preventative care, just knowing that it is going to be part of your journey. Um, yeah, like Carolyn, you know, there, there's sometimes you need to have two months of vaccinations, you're going to feel a bit not great for a little bit, but it is so worth it to be somewhere and to be safe and to, to uh, be maybe in a mosquito infested area, but seeing like a baby elephant and a little baby Cape Buffalo. Mm -hmm. Um, for, just, for those of you who got scared by all of that, <laughs> um, mm -hmm. I didn't sleep in any tents. I didn't need any mosquito nets. I was in hotels all the time, and I did see baby elephants and baby little buffalo. <laughs> um, so you don't, you don't, if you really don't want to get into the wilds, you don't have to, and you can still do safari. Yeah, I didn't have to take all the shots either because I was in South Africa. And mm -hmm. really good medical system there. Now, what about packing? Because I think that's the other another thing we could get some advice from you all on. Um, what kinds of things would you su suggest? I mean, we talked a bit about bug nets and things like that, but whether whether it's uh, footwear, clothing, any suggestions, Sandra, Diane? Uh, yeah. Well, like um, I forget, was it white? You're supposed to wear long pants white. and long sleeves, and I think it was white, long pants, white, yeah. long sleeves. Um, and the other thing to, uh, that you may not be aware of is the safaris go out very, very early in the morning or mm -hmm. late in the afternoon. So you're you're getting it's cold. Let's say yes, four in the morning, and it's, it's cold. So you need a warm jacket. Mm -hmm. They will usually give yeah. you a blanket or something to put on your lap. But I had. Mm -hmm. So I definitely had a hoodie and a warm jacket. I actually had a toque with me. I was very happy. I mm -hmm. took gloves. It was, it was like, um, I don't know, plus 10. It was cold. It was really cold. Mm -hmm. in the yeah. That was a surprise. But I, I mm -hmm. travel with layers. You can always take them off. Mm -hmm. Diane, anything to add? No, I would agree with Sandra. I, I was going to say layers is always for me, but especially in a situation like that, because the temperatures vary so much from daytime to very early morning to late evening, it, it really gets cold at night. You know, mm -hmm. it really, really gets cold. Mm -hmm. So layers always, no matter where I travel, I always do layers anyway. So, um, but long sleeves, long pants, long sleeves. Mm -hmm. oh. If, if any of you have trouble sitting and you have problems with that, you may want to have some sort of a blow up cushion for your bum or your back or something, because you're in this um, van or um, Jeep, which is really just mm -hmm. a metal seat or something for hours, three, four hours. Mm -hmm. you're, you don't have nice highways. You, you're literally, you know, on grass and roads and bumps and you're jiggling and wiggling all day. One of the times my husband had his iPhone in his pocket and we really had sat and that it was, wasn't there, it was in India. We were in, the, in a car the entire day, a Jeep. And he came home and it said he had 25,000 steps he did that day. <laughs> never, never gotten up once. <laughs> I to that too. The roads, the roads are rough, and um, so shoes, mm -hmm. um, shoes would be. I I had um, hiking boots yeah. that I wore most of the time, just because everything was so rocky. Mm -hmm. but, yeah. mm -hmm. Nora, anything else on on what to pack or what to wear? 
Yeah, I would say um, also think about elevation. If you're going somewhere like the Rift Valley, it is very high elevation. So I always bring a water bottle with me. They'll have potable mm -hmm. water for you, but have something that you can fill up all the time. Know that when, and you know, at, just jet lag in general, you're not gonna feel super excellent on the first day. So lots of hydration, you might have a headache um, and always have like a big old hat because the sun, depending on where you are, mm -hmm. if you're lower than Uganda, then you're going to be in the Southern mm -hmm. hemisphere and you're going to be right on the equator. Um, the sun will bake your head. You want to make sure that when you are out and about, you are, are comfortable. So also sunglasses. Um, if you're going as far as South Africa and you're going to go see the penguins, uh, which are mm -hmm. amazing. Um, yeah, mm -hmm. you want to have like polarized lenses because you want to be able to see the penguins and not go like, it's, it's so bright here. Um, but, you know, you want to be you want to be cozy and comfy when you're there. Um, it's very easy. I always I well. I always wear jangly earrings and I always have like a scarf with me and the rest of my packing is I have like three t-shirts and a couple pairs of pants. Um, but the way you get fancy when you're having like a fancy safari night or if you're in town is for me, jangly earrings right. and suddenly bam. Uh, mm -hmm. So I would say, you know, wear things that the, uh, that are gonna be light and flowy, but then are also just gonna be like comfortable if you do get a little dirty, a little muddy, depending on what you're doing. Mm -hmm. um, now we definitely took um, bug repellent with DEET in it. I don't know how anybody feels mm -hmm. about that, but our travel mm -hmm. medical, we have travel medical clinics here, I'm assuming all across Canada. You have mm -hmm. to go in and have a conversation with them and they're gonna go through exactly what you need in terms of medication or shots or anything for the time of year in the country you're going to. So um, mm -hmm. said, don't leave without the, the, the stuff that had DEET in it uh, mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. make sure you don't get bitten. Now, question around getting there. Um, how did you all travel there? Was it direct? Did you stop through Frankfurt or Abu Dhabi or like what, what was the because it's hard to get a direct flight. I will just say if anyone is flying through Ethiopia, bring your own sandwich <laughs> because it is a nice enough airport. Um, but I've connected through Ethiopia a few times and just, just bring some snacks with you. It is hard. It's a bit harder to navigate than somewhere like Nairobi, which is wonderful. Joburg is great as well. Um, Ghana has a lovely airport. Um, Ethiopia didn't have air conditioning when I was there. And they also didn't have electricity in half of the airport the first time I was there and didn't have any, like you couldn't even get water. So, um, so I just, I always travel with snacks. I'm very snack based person. Um, but no, if you are doing a bunch of stops or you're doing a long haul somewhere, just um, just have a couple things in your back pocket. Make sure that you're comfortable. There's no reason to be a martyr when you're going on such an amazing trip and a lifetime trip. If you like snacks at home, if you need, like, need and want to be hydrated like all of us, then bring those comforts from home with you. You're gonna have a much better time and um and yeah you want to have a good time so just um you know be patient but have some trail mix <laughs> we also travel with a tiny little fan uh, yeah. tiny, tiny little mm -hmm. fan one that plugs into our computer um and it has been a lifesaver even in a london hotel where the air conditioning was supposed to be there but who knows it was uh, we've used that fan a lot yeah, that's a great idea. Yeah, just like these little things that don't take up a lot of space, yeah. but then in the middle of, yeah, sometimes London gets real hot. In the middle of that, you're just like, oh my gosh, <laughs> this is saving me and everyone around me. I'm just a nicer person with this van. <laughs> oh, Carolyn, you're on mute. Sorry. Um... Nora, you may not know the answer to this, but in terms of if you want to see certain animals, where are the best places to go, like Tanzania or 
for gorillas or is there any mm. best places depending on what kind of animals you want to see? Yeah. Yeah, that it, it's such a good question because the animals are are pretty regional and pretty specific. Like if you do want to see gorillas, it is Uganda and Rwanda. Um, mm -hmm. If you mm -hmm. want to see cheetahs, like Namibia is the best place to go. There are other places um, because there are, you know, borders are made up. So animals kind of go everywhere. Um, if you are looking for, you know, the big five, if you're looking for Cape Buffalo and lions and, um, and elephants, why did I put elephants at the end of that? Um, it, you know, Tanzania and Kenya, Malawi, South Africa, the places that, um, the places that advertise safaris will, will advertise exactly what you're going to see there. And, if you're going to a big national park like Kruger, they're they're all there. If you're going to like a smaller private safari area, they'll be there as well. There will just not be so many. So if you're going to the Maasai Mara uh, during uh, the great migration with all the wildebeest there, mm -hmm. you're going to see tons of wildebeest and the, the guides will make sure that you are seeing um, like at, at, ver at the very start, and if you email the, the, the companies you're looking at and you say, this is my list, this is what I want to see, the guides, like good guides, will say yes, yes, or like, oh, we can't really guarantee that. I would say be really hesitant if someone's saying we guarantee that you see all of these animals because mm -hmm. they're wild animals, right? Like they go mm -hmm. where they want to go. It's hard to miss the wildebeest in the great migration because there's <laughs> a million. Um, but if you really want to see, um, if you really want to see a baby dick dick, they're like, they're very small antelope. They're, they're very cute. Um, and someone says, I can guarantee you're going to see one. You go, but how though? Is this animal habituated to people? Is this animal going to be in a cage somewhere? And you can even ask that. How can you guarantee that? And they could even say like, oh, we have like a mating pair that are very comfortable and very safe. And we know exactly like where to sneak up and look at them and then run away. Um, you know, there's no questions that, that are off limits when, when you're planning a trip of your lifetime, I would say never be offended by asking questions because great people who want to share this trip with you are going to say, yeah, actually fair enough. That is a good question. I'm really proud to say, these are the animals you will see. You might not see this because they're endemic to, to another area, but you will see this like kind of kind of a cop-out uh answer for you <laughs> no it's great it was i think great. one of the biggest surprises was how many hours you're sitting in a vehicle or something i'm going to say and seeing nothing it, it's not like a zoo where every corner you turn there's gonna be an mm. animal you could drive mm -hmm. for an hour and a half imagine in a convertible car for an hour and a half and the wind is blowing at you and it's just a savanna. It's just like there's just nothing to see. So you have to be prepared for that as well. It's just, you know, a lot of yeah. sitting around and waiting for the finding the animals. I think that's an excellent point, right? Like animals, mm -hmm. as we all know from the great circle of life, like lions eat the antelope and then the lions turn into the grass and the grass, the antelope mm -hmm. eat the grass. But all of these animals are trying to eat or not get eaten. And so if a group tells you in an hour, you're going to be able to see every single animal, that's not no. what nature wants. Uh, giraffes don't want to be that close to lions and uh, mm -hmm. Cape Buffalo don't want to be close to anyone. They're very grumpy. And so you, you know, it, you want to be looking at a group that says safari is in the morning and in the evening. They're long days because we want to show you as many animals as possible because we are going to go to a watering hole and that has, we know that there's hippos there. And then we're going to go to um, trees that we know cheetahs are at. It's, Sandra, that's a really good point. There's a lot of going here and going there and going everywhere because there's there's amazing birds everywhere if you're a birder mm -hmm. you are going to be delighted um, but if you're looking for really like charismatic megafauna 
big animals, um, you're going to have to like uh, work for it a little bit if you want to see them in in their glory, free and happy. It sounds like I don't like birds. They're very nice. <laughs> <laughs> The, the other cool like thing that. that I remember is the way the um, the safari leaders, how would you say, I never realized how important dung was. And they were mm -hmm. getting out and looking at the dung to figure out what animal was nearby, how hot or warm it was to see how far away or how long ago they left it there. And that became a whole mm -hmm. of our day, spotting the dung and the shape of it and, and whatever. <laughs> Yeah, like if you look at these, the elephants that have been walking through China, they have been walking for 500 kilometers. And so if you went to China to see elephants, that would be a lifetime experience. But if you went there and you went to the area that they're supposed to be, they're now 500 kilometers away. So it's good to have a guide that like, that looks at this poo and goes like, there are no elephants here, but there will be some by this warm poo. And it's nice having a guide to do that for you. You don't have to look up before you go away. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Carolyn, did you have a question? Yeah, I was going to ask, did you have to worry about um, snakes? My, I love animals, but not the reptilian snake. <laughs> did you have to worry about them sneaking into your bed at night? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to have nightmares now. Please answer this well. <laughs> so all the safaris that I have been on, there is always people that are awake at all times. There's someone that has a gun with them. And the gun typically is not to kill the animals. The gun is to fire in the air and the animals get scared. Um, and so there's always people that are awake and there's generally always like a fire or something like that. And the people that are awake are not just like you know, talking with the lads. They are like walking around the perimeter, seeing if there's animals around. I have seen a few snakes um, in Africa, none of them in my tent, which is great. Mm -hmm. um, but all of the, the thing about the, the guides there is they also don't want you to see a snake and they're also not very we're all kind of snake hesitant. Um, so, so generally what they do is before safari tents go down, before they build any structures or things like that, they make sure that there are no hibernaculums. That's where, where snakes sleep, but there are, there's no snaky areas. Um, so <laughs> Carolyn, I totally get you. I'm on the same page. <laughs> yeah. Uh, when I was in Uganda, I confused the Swahili word for mud and snake. And they told me I should be careful because there was mud. And I was like, I was totally fine. I'm Canadian. I just, I walked through everything. And at the end of the day, they were like, oh, that's really cool of you that you didn't want to wear such, like I wore pretty high boots most days. And that day I was just wearing sneakers. And they said, wow, that was like very, like you have the heart of a warrior. You're walking through mud. And I was like, why do you care about mud? And someone said, hmm, the word that I'm saying might not be the word that you're thinking of. And he said this word and he drew it a snake. And I was like, oh I hate that no thank you <laughs> so they will they will always communicate with you if there is a snaky area if there is like a snake around um but typically everyone wants to stay away from them because they are they're not great uh they are great they're not great to interact with um but the other thing is snakes also feel the rumble of the trucks they feel the rumble of us they don't want to be around. They don't want to get stepped on by an elephant. And so they very much interpret all the people walking and trucks and things like that as elephants and get out of there. It is a good question. Mm. So did you say that uh, you should not wear sneakers around snakes? You should have, like a full body armor? Or... <laughs> yeah, full body armor, hazmat suit, so you're good to go. Um... <laughs> No, I would say, um, yeah, like I wear hiking boots and I wear kind of like thick socks. Um, but most snakes like do not want to bite you. And the reason is it takes a lot of energy for snakes to make poison. And so it like calorically, they, like if a snake bites you, it goes like, ugh. 
I got to use all of this on this thing because it was bugging me. I know, you but have to- I have a lot of calories that I could share with that. <laughs> Anyway, <laughs> don't we all, Carolyn? <laughs> but so, so most snakes, when they bite you, they actually won't inject poison the first time. It takes a couple times. I know this is it's a terrible conversation, but it does mean that you're not around snaky areas. There are people that are looking around to make sure that there are no snakes. They have their eyes cast on snake land, and then if you, yeah, hiking boots thicker socks a snake is gonna go ah this is this is too much work much work okay <laughs> so the, snake, the snake discussion took us a little over time sorry about that but an important question carolyn so no problem mm-hmm. um, um i want to circle back i know we went through a lot those of you that had questions did this answer some of your questions that you had yes are there still any that you have unresolved? Because we can go find those answers for you too. Um, Cheryl, I have a question. I have a question. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Can I go ahead? Um, well, I think I heard a few um, time frames. So my question is: Is there a, a like Carolyn? You mentioned I think you were a week and a half. Someone mentioned they were there for two weeks. And I know everybody goes at a time. Well, I guess it depends what they're doing. But if you're going to go there, is is two weeks too short is like, how do you gauge it? I don't know what everyone else thinks, but the jet lag alone, you, you know, you need some time to recover and the mm-hmm. trip back is brutal. Like I think it's 24 hours, mm-hmm. like a, quite a long way back. So I would mm-hmm. personally, I, I wish I had stayed longer to, 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 and seen more of Africa. So mm-hmm. that would, yeah. So longer as in two weeks, three weeks, like. Yeah, I don't know why I rushed back. Like I look at it and go, why did I come back? It was August. I could have stayed, I could have stayed longer. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I would say if you have the ability to stay longer than two weeks, you would never regret it. There's so Mm -hmm. much to see in so many different places. Mm -hmm. If, If you only have two weeks, you will you will fill your agenda and it will be amazing. But if you could squeak out a little bit longer, you're not gonna get bored. Mm-hmm. And, and I found it easy. I mean, I was on a service trip, but I found it easy to get around and everybody was very, very gracious, very kind. I was not scared for one minute, like um, at all, even in the Nairobi airport, which is a little, a little mm-hmm. not. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, I was grateful that I got into a lounge in the Nairobi airport because there wasn't much there. It was under construction, mm-hmm. um, but um, but no, beautiful place. Mm-hmm. And I stayed right next door, by the way, to Karen Blixen's house, um, which I would also recommend. It's a beautiful place. Um, oh, it's a coffee. It's a I can't remember the name of it at the moment, but. Um, but I would just go back to stay there again. It was beautiful. So. Hmm. Mm. So a question on bringing clothing or school supplies. I don't know about that. I, I'm gonna answer that. Uh, so my company works with uh, Child Safe and uh, we help make sure in tourism, kids are not um, trafficked or uh, exploited in any ways. And we used to think it was a really good idea to bring used clothing and school supplies and stuff for children, but that does create a glut in the local market and like local people making clothes no longer make them and and other things happen. Um, And the same thing with people that sell school supplies locally. So it, it feels like a good thing, but it actually is not very helpful. Um, donating money locally is, is really good. Donating time, of course, as well. But there are, there's lots of really amazing programs that you can just donate money locally and that makes sure money and economy goes into, generally it's women's co-ops and it's educational campaigns and things like that. So we make sure that, that all boats rise and, and everyone gets help. It's a good question, though, because, you know, we see these kids and we want to help them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think culturally, I mean, for girls, um, 
the, the push now is for girls to get educated. Mm -hmm. um, and, and a lot of these countries are polygamous, so mm -hmm. a lot of cultural uh, mm -hmm. nuances to understand as well. There are some amazing charities that help women get menstruation products. And I think those are also really cool to Google and support and look at because so many girls, once they start menstruating, aren't welcome or just don't go to school because of the shame in that. And so there are some awesome places that are uh, giving away free menstruation products or showing people how to like make their own like cloth pads and things like that. So, um, so I would say uh, look up that and, um, and there's brilliant people all over the world doing, doing amazing things. And also I would say like, look up uh, Child, Child Safe as, a, as an organization. I can put their link up in here. Yeah, and we'll we'll um we'll publish a bunch of links and do some more research on this and and provide you with more information. But if you have questions, please send them to me at editor at journeywoman.com. And um and I'm gonna be speaking with some of the tourism boards as well and tour operators, and we'll get you some more answers on this as we as we put our editorial together. But I want to let you go, even as fascinating as this is, I know it's 10 after, so I want to make sure you <laughs> so you have your evening to yourselves, but if you want to stay on, we can. I'm just going to get some more wine. <laughs> <laughs> These are always fun. I don't suppose anybody has an estimate on the percentage or the time frame for vaccination of, of people in Africa. Mm. Now it's so low, right? So I guess that's something we'll have to just monitor. Yeah. The, I mean, it's a really important question because we don't want to go anywhere where, where people haven't been fully vaccinated yet. The marine biologist that we work in South Africa said that she won't be vaccinated until 2022. So, oh, wow. yeah. So there is a lot of groups right now are saying we recognize that that is not sustainable and we can't stop tourism that long. So they're like these vaccine passports and things like that that they're talking about are even more important. Um, and it does look like for the next couple of years, it will be social distanced uh, safaris, uh, which will be smaller groups, which is amazing. Um, and there will be like mask mandates and things like that. Um, and just following like CDC and Health Canada protocols with what it looks like to be in these vulnerable communities. Um, every country is different and every country um, or countries like Canada and America are giving a lot of vaccines away, which is wonderful, but every, every country does have a different timeline. So it's um, some are opening up this autumn, um, but it will mean that their populations aren't vaccinated. So they will be saying that, that volunteer or travelers will have to be fully vaccinated. Great. Well, thank you all for uh, joining tonight and sharing your stories and and all your questions. It's great. This is all about curiosity. So I'm, I'm thrilled that uh, you could spend time with us tonight. And I just want to remind you, we have community calls every Friday, which are somewhat like this, actually, uh, every Friday at 10 a.m. And um, in our next book club, I know some of you were in our book club, like Mary. Um, uh, our next book club is on July 21st, and we're, we're, we're reading a book about Greece. So, um, yeah. <laughs> so have a lovely evening. Thank you all again. You. And uh, look forward to hearing more questions and hearing your feedback on this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.